How do we survive a seemingly tyrannical two-tiered justice government for the next four years, let alone the next ten years, if that's what Sir Keir Starmer really wants? Now, a few obligatory caveats. I say seemingly because that's the opinion that I garner online from reading lots and lots of different messages and viewpoints from different people. I say tyrannical because we've seen people going to prison for many months for things that they've written on Facebook that they didn't really mean, probably, anyway, and yet they've gone to prison nonetheless. The less. And I say suit two tier because notwithstanding we've seen people going to prison for what they've posted on Facebook, we've seen people escaping prison for all sorts of really serious offences, some of which involving children and all sorts of serious assaults that I won't say on YouTube for fear of this video getting um, blacklisted and no one will ever see it. But they've escaped prison for all sorts of silly reasons. For example, the prisons were overcrowded. And there's an example of this, in fact, that I'll come to. Now, I will be giving you some ideas on how to survive this seemingly tyrannical period for the next few years to keep yourselves out of trouble, but I'll also be telling you some stories along the way, just to bring this back to reality. Now, the case that you've all probably read about where the chap was supposed to go to prison because of a serious assault is probably the best example of where the judges have been pressured by the system. So I don't blame the judges because it's not the judge's fault. But there's clear pressure upon the judges not to send certain people into prison where they should have otherwise gone to prison, in the judge's own words. And I quote from the judge's words, if we had been in different times, then it would have been virtually inevitable that you would have had to go into custody. The only reason you've escaped immediate custody today is because of the prison overcrowding crisis. So he would have gone to prison because of a serious offence. Now, if he hasn't gone to prison because of the overcrowding crisis, then that does beg the question as to why people posting things on Facebook, as horrible as those posts have been, I don't condone and I don't agree with things that have been posted on Facebook or social media, calling for violence and calling for people to be attacked and so on. I don't condone those, I don't support those, but it does raise the question, why have they gone to prison when others haven't? Particularly when we look at recent news. Now, I did a video which I I've unlisted so it doesn't kill the YouTube algorithm, but I did a video where I described why the chap that threw objects at Nigel Farage didn't go to prison. Now, I'll re-explain that here in the context of this. Not that I agree with it. Sometimes I give you the raw, honest truth on this channel. It's not necessarily what I agree with. I'm just telling you as it is. And if you like this fresh, blunt, brutal approach to what's going on, please do consider subscribing because I am not mainstream media. I'm not going to be mainstream media. I've turned down investments multiple times to sort of work with me on my channel here and become producers of my channel. Not going to happen because I promise you the brutal, honest truth on this channel. So please do subscribe if you want this as a fresh alternative. But the reason that chap didn't go to prison, not that I agree with it. If you want my personal opinion on these things, I reserve those for Black Belt Secrets, my other channel linked in the description below. But the reason that he didn't go to prison is that he was, in my view, perhaps charged with something that gave the judge no real alternative but to give him a suspended sentence because it was much more lenient in the way that those offences are charged and the sentencing guidelines provide for. So he was charged with a bog-standard Section 4 public order offence, which is just putting someone else in fear of immediate unlawful violence by your words or behaviour or insults and so on. Now, was that correctly charged? Now, I'm not criticising the prosecutors here because they very often will charge something that they are more confident in securing a prosecution or a guilty plea or whatever. Not that we should condone plea bargaining. I don't think we should. But very often it is charged much less so that they secure a conviction. However, had he been charged with violent disorder, that would have been a very different story. He would most likely have got a custodial sentence immediately of something in the region of 20 to 30 months, because that's what the sentencing guidelines call for. And that's what would have been in front of the judge to be able to pass sentence. So enough about the seemingly tyrannical two-tier justice system government that we've got going on at the moment. Let's talk about what you can actually do about this to keep yourself safe for the next few years. I've got a short bullet point list of things here that I'm going to talk about, so feel free to make notes, pause the video, come back, bookmark it, share it, all that sort of stuff, which also helps the YouTube algorithms and helps me out to grow my audience, but let's get into a few of those now. The first one will be really ironic. The first one is don't base any of your decisions and your, certainly life decisions and important decisions, don't base them on what you learn on YouTube. 
I know, ironic, because here I am on YouTube giving you guidance. But that's the important point here. It is just guidance. Nothing that I tell you in my videos is ever intended to be, nor should be relied upon as legal advice. And you shouldn't rely on anyone on YouTube for advice. Guidance, yes, but go away, do your own research. Go away, get your own advice. I get so many emails saying, this is just a yes, no question on this set of facts. Can you do a YouTube video about this? Now, no, I can't really. All I, all I can do is give you a broad overview and the guidance as to how things would normally apply in that situation. It can't be taken as legal advice and you shouldn't be relying on anything you say on YouTube as legal advice or financial advice or anything else. But if you want tips on how to make money, I have another channel, which is Daniel Shensmith, also linked in the description below. But just case in point, I've known of a few channels just recently, I'm not going to name and shame anybody, but a few channels have recently been demonetized because I believe they've had strikes for misinformation because they've been saying something as though it is absolute fact, as absolute truth, etc., which in my view could get people into serious trouble. I've commented on some of those before um, and I just believe that if people rely on those as advice and fact and they get into trouble, that is why YouTube has these systems to demonetize channels that are making money off giving people misinformation. So that's just case in point. In fact, I get lots of emails from people asking me to talk about this, that, or the other video because it seems to them to be nonsense, and humbly they come to me for what they believe is going to be more helpful and more accurate guidance. And I'm not saying I'm always going to be right. I won't likely always be right, which is why you shouldn't rely on everything I say, but I would hope that it's more researched than most. Uh, I wouldn't bring something to you unless I was absolutely researched on it. So you always need to consider your own circumstances, your own set of facts, go off and get your own discreet advice on all of these things. But also not just around you, but online as well. Because if you are online, there's all sorts of horrific stories. Now there's one with Apple. I believe they dropped this uh, system where they were scanning your photos for things that perhaps shouldn't be there or that might flag some kind of alerts because they were planning to develop a system whereby they might report them to the police. But I did read of such a story with another online provider that when a chap was asked by the doctor to send photographs of his son to diagnose a problem in an intimate area, so he took these fairly high resolution photos and took, sent them to the doctor to diagnose the problem. The doctor prescribed something and got rid of the problem, but a few days later his whole account just disappeared. It was locked access, everything else. And not only that, he had the police coming around and asking him questions about what these photos were and why they were there. Obviously, it was all resolved. He just said, well, this was a conversation with the doctor. The doctor confirmed it, etc. But he didn't re regain access to his account. His access to his account, his whole account, emails, everything, was completely locked down and blocked and seemingly no response. Now, I'm not naming who it was because I don't know how it ended. I don't know all the facts. And that's me being cautious because I don't know what the end tale of that story was. So if I tell you all that as fact and who it was without the outcome, then that might be defamatory. So I'm not going to say who that was. But also, whilst you're on Online, there are also lots of other risks as well, such as visiting malicious websites, even malicious adverts and malicious downloads and files and all sorts of things. Not to mention people tracking what you're doing, for example, visiting certain websites and things like that, which is why I partner on my channel with NordVPN. I've been a partner with NordVPN for quite some time now. I use it myself. I paid for it with my own money even before I partnered with NordVPN. And NordVPN will give you that peace of mind knowing that there are no logs of any websites you visit, any of your downloads, your browsing history, etc. They've been independently audited a number of times to show that they do really keep zero logs of your activity online. Now, of course, none of you watching are planning to visit a dangerous or malicious website, but we have had people come to us that have had their identities stolen, they've had their accounts taken over because they visited a malicious website, and NordVPN will flag up those sites or downloads as you come across them. Of course, as a partner to my channel, I can get you four months extra free free with the link in the description below. In fact, if you see at the top there, it says your status is protected. If you go to this website, which is nordvpn.com slash BBB, because that's 
the nickname you gave me, and that wasn't intended to rhyme, but if you go to that website, it will show you that you are not protected. It will show you your IP address and your location, which shows you just how easy it is for these companies to find out this information about you. In fact, quite some time ago, when I was browsing the internet without NordVPN, I was shopping for office furniture. A few days later, I got an email to me, my wife, and my clerk to say that they knew, because of their software, that I'd be shopping for office furniture. And they'd got all of our email addresses, which means their software had taken the IP address and other search information whilst we were browsing online. They tracked us down, found us out, and started emailing me and my wife and my staff. But you can cut all of that out and maintain your privacy online using NordVPN, which is one thing that I highly recommend you do in this very dangerous time moving forward to protect what you're doing online. So check out the link in the description below and grab yourselves four months extra free. You get 30 days to change your mind, but the peace of mind is well worth it. Now, a few horror stories here. I've had a few cases come to the firm in the last few years which have really heightened the concerns that I have on certain things. So I will give you these as a broad guidance so you can think about them moving forward. Probably things that you've never even thought of before. Now, the first one is being careful as to who you invite into your home. Now, there's a few stories about this. One person had a few antique firearms in his home. They were perfectly legal. There was nothing wrong with them at all. He had someone come in to do some work around the house and reported him to the police. So before you know, he's got the firearms squad at his house, raiding his house to take these things away. And long story short, they worked out that they were antiques, they were perfectly legal and there was nothing wrong, but not before putting him through weeks and weeks of misery. The next story, in my view, is rather evil. There was a plumber went to a house to do some work on the boiler and the heating system of this house. Little did he know that the person in the house had collaborated with the person opposite, for whatever reason, to get this plumber into trouble. The person in the house suggested that the person opposite also wanted work doing on their system, and duly, he went over to examine and do a little bit of work on their system. The person in that house tipped them some money and off they went. The person in house number one then reported this plumber to his employer, who duly sacked him for moonlighting, doing another job on the job. Which just goes to show, I don't know why people do this, but why you just sometimes you can't trust people. So always take this air of caution about every little thing that you do. If you're out doing jobs for a company, just don't do anything outside of your company's rules and things like that. Now, this guy was just being helpful and was just given a tip for helping someone out, which proves that good old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Another good tip of being very careful is when you are out and about in the street, being mindful of who is around you, who is in front of you, who's behind you. Now, I'm not victim blaming here, but if you walk around with your phone in your hand like this, you are advertising, here is a 200 pounds or 1,000 pounds or 1,500 pounds piece of equipment that you can take off me very easily because my attention's focused on it and someone can yank it out of your hand. Now, I'm not victim blaming. This is just a sad fact of reality that if you are walking around like that, people can take it off you very easily. Just like if you, again, with the helping someone out scenario of in someone's house, this applies in the street as well. A horrific story, video actually, that I saw online just a couple of days ago. Someone was out and there was one person was on the floor looking like they'd collapsed and in trouble. There was another person standing next to them. So Good Samaritan went up to the person on the floor and tried to help them out. The second person actually walked behind this person and injected them with something to knock them out and then mugged them of all their possessions. Which again, fairly evil, but just goes to show you have to be very careful. If Even if you're trying to help somebody out of the goodness of your heart, just be mindful of who's around, what they're doing, and especially if you're alone but they're not alone, you really have to think twice about all of these things every time you're moving around. Now. When anyone walks around with me, they'll know that I'm somewhat suspicious and paranoid and that I'm always looking around and checking different directions. I firmly believe that I have stopped more than one mugging, not just of myself, but other people before now. Um, one was absolutely certain because he grabbed someone's handbag and because I was already aware of it as he was coming across the road, I grabbed him, took him to the floor and removed the bag from him, gave it back to the lady, called the police and he was arrested. So you have to be very careful and mindful of what's going on around you. And just on the subject of technology as well, we've known people that have installed cheap CCTV only to then hear a voice through the cameras late at night and somebody was talking to their child through the CCTV because this was a 
cheap sort of off-brand CCTV camera connecting to a malicious website or it was hacked or something else and somebody was watching and talking to their child. So this really goes to show you have to have complete trust in the company that sells you this equipment. Not that I guarantee that all of the big tech companies are completely trustworthy either. But sticking with the theme of trust or lack of trust, I have a couple of stories about local authorities and why I don't trust local authorities anymore. One's a personal story and one is pinched from somebody else. One of my own story is that whilst on the one hand there is no obligation to inform a local authority when someone someone moves in or out of a property via V council tax, unless they ask you the question of course, if they ask you whether there's any change or if they ask you who is there for the purposes of council tax then you have to tell them because you can't be dishonest, but you've no obligation to inform them of updates and things like that. You just don't have to say that and that was decided in a case where someone was prosecuted for fraud for failing to tell them and the case failed on appeal I recall because they said that she hadn't been dishonest by not telling them that the situation had changed. She was only found to be dishonest on those counts where they'd asked her the question and she didn't respond or she gave false information. But on the counts where she just didn't tell them, that was perfectly fine because there was no obligation for her to do so. Now, despite that, we did tell the local authority that there'd been a change and the local authority officers told us that they froze the council tax on this property because it was empty and vacant and being refurbished and it was not inhabitable at that time. And so they appeared to have some kind of consideration for us and said that they'd frozen the council tax on the property until we got it refurbished so that we could let it out again. But lo and behold, later, when it was ready to let again, they then said, no, that was wrong. The lady that spoke to us said, I don't care what the other people said. They shouldn't have told you that. It's due. You've got to pay it. And here's a bill for it. Now, you can understand why I was a little bit annoyed here, because not only had they told us that council tax was frozen on the property, but there was no obligation for us to tell them in the first place. And we were just being completely upfront and honest even though there was no legal obligation to do so. So again, take formal advice if you're in a situation where you're wondering whether you're in a position that you have to tell them a certain thing. Because if you don't have to tell them, and certainly going forward, if I don't have to tell them, I'm not going to tell them because they just don't have any consideration whatsoever, even though you've done the right thing and told them the right thing, which again comes back to my earlier point. No good deed goes unpunished. So if you don't have to tell them, keep it to yourself. I hate to have to say that as guidance, you understand, but that's just the way we are because they had no consideration whatsoever. They didn't care about the situation. They even went back on what they'd originally said. So which in my view is disingenuous, possibly challengeable in the courts, but it's a lot of time and effort, and ultimately all they'll do is say that this is the law, they're following the law, and they are allowed to bill us the council tax and make that decision. And so even though we might go around in circles, maybe win, maybe not, but by the time we've done all that, it's time, effort, expense, stress, etc. It's just not worth the couple of months worth of council tax to go through all of that, to argue over it. And to top it off, they even recorded the calls and then refused to give us the copy of the call recording without going through hoops of to prove who we are and all of this sort of stuff, even though they'd been corresponding with us anyway. So that just goes to irony, really, because if they'd been corresponding with us in the first place, then that would have been our personal data. And if they didn't know who we are, it would have been a breach of personal data and data protection. But then when we ask for more information, because we wanted a copy of the call where they had told us that it was frozen, they said, no, we can't give it to you because of data protection. So make up your mind. Are you corresponding with us and you're happy with that? And you're happy that you're satisfied who we are to tell us to correspond with us? Or have you now changed your mind because we asked for something? This sounds a little bit familiar, a little bit my previous story with uh, an insurance company who uh, on the one hand said they didn't have any of the records that I wanted and yet relied upon them when refusing my complaint. And so I said, well, if you're relying on them to refuse the complaint, surely you've got the records, so please hand them over. They can't have it both ways. And so that's another little final tip that I'll leave you with, really. Document absolutely everything, because you could always refer back to it. A court is always going to prefer the contemporaneous documentary evidence. Who said what, when and where, word for word if possible, recorded if possible. There's nothing against you recording your own telephone calls if it's for your own contemporaneous notes and records. 
your household purpose so that you've got an accurate record of precisely what was said, just record the call and then annotate it perfectly. Um, there's an app that I use called Mac Whisper. This is not a sponsored portion of the video. It was, I think, $10 or $15, and you can dump a recording into there, and it will transcribe it just like that. Very accurate, very useful, and if you want to keep a contemporaneous record of all those uh, conversations, I strongly recommend that you do that, because if you get into these arguments later and they say, no, we didn't say that, or we didn't agree to that, if you've got it on record, your own records, then a court is more likely to believe that, particularly if you've got the recording of it. But there we are. There's my final tips. So in summary, be careful of who you invite into your house. Be careful of when you're out and about. Look in front, look behind, think twice before helping somebody. Um, don't trust anybody necessarily. Make sure you take advantage of my offer with NordVPN to keep yourself safe and secure and private online with a completely secure and private IP address, which keeps no logs of what you're doing while you're online. Be careful of what photographs you store on the cloud and things like that, particularly with whom you share them. And don't trust local authorities I've found, or some insurance companies for that matter, because it turns out they're not on your side. They'll use what they can against you. They'll go back on their word. They don't care about your circumstances and they'll do everything they can to basically screw you over, is my experience. And so coming full circle, I can wholeheartedly understand why people believe online from the opinions that I've read that this is a tyrannical government that is on the face of it operating as a two-tier justice system. It's technically not for reasons that I've explained. Different offences, different sentencing guidelines, judges are doing what they're supposed to do. But it does beg the question why some people are not going to prison for really serious offences because the prisons are full when other people are going to prison for things that just because it was caught up in something else that was really serious. And that does raise a really serious question. But leave me your thoughts and comments, uh, being careful about what you say, obviously, given everything I've said in this video. Please do subscribe if you like this brutal, raw analysis of what's going on. And as always, thank you for watching.